So let's start. Thank you very much for coming today to listen to the first uh, talk of the Anchis project. My name is Giacomo Sola. I'm working with Michael Calcia, that is one of the partners of the project. And my role is just to introduce the discussion and give you the basic requirements in order to have a successful uh, presentation. So first of all, please keep your microphones mute all over the presentation. And of course, since there is a chat for technical issue, you can ask any question if there is any technical problem and our team will try to assist you as soon as possible. Please remember that this session will be recorded and then published online on the project website. So please, if you are shy or for any reason you don't want it to appear in the final video, let us inform in order to find the solution. It's enough to send us a message in order to in, uh, stop the possible confusion. If you have any question, there are two, two choices. Please, you can, first of all, to use the chat once more in order to post your question. Then at the end, when the question and answer session will start, Marco will collect all the questions and will report them to the speaker. The alternative could be to raise your hand if you want something more interactive at the end. And of course, you will give the floor. Please be very short in asking your question, not to jeopardize the discussion with your presentation. Well, the session will be introduced by Veronique, Veronique Czankowski is the director of the Col Francaise d'Athene. She has been also the coordinator of the previous nature project that was, let's say, the father or the mother of the Anchis project. After her presentation, finally, Sorina, that was so kind to be the first speaker of our series of webinars, will talk about the use of artificial intelligence in the fight against looting and trafficking of cultural books. It's time to introduce the Mentimeter. There is a Mentimeter opportunity that has been given. If you have uh, put this QR code into your camera, you have already access probably the multimeter session of the project. There is already one first question that has been posted, and this is just to allow us to better understand the people that is around the table. It is a very simple question about your previous experience in this kind of projects. And please provide us with your information, with this information in order to continue. My role is over. I give the floor to Veronica. And please uh, enjoy this presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. So, uh, dear participants, fellow researchers, members of the Yankees Consortium, partners of the project, and dear friends of our institutions, thank you for joining us today for the very first Anki's talk webinar. Anki's is a Horizon Europe project. It started in 2023. It is coordinated by the Ecole Française d'Athènes. We are a French research center in Greece since almost 180 years, whom I have the honor to be the director. But Anki's is also a metaphor for the cultural heritage that we must take care of like the hero Aeneas in mythology, who carried his father Anchise on his shoulders when he escaped the Trojan War and went for the foundation of Rome. 
This Ankis project is a joint initiative shared with 15 partners from all over Europe, crossing the methodology of networking that has proved its efficiency in the former H2020 Nature project, we aim to develop a global and comprehensive response to the challenges of effective protection of cultural heritage in Europe for both antiquities and modern cultural goods in order to provide sustainable and replicable solutions to be used by our community uh, of uh, researchers. In that order, Ankis develops a toolkit of innovative technological solutions uh, in order to help uh, researchers, actors from the law enforcement services, art dealers and other professionals from the private and public sector in order to protect cultural heritage in Europe. As you can see, the Ankis project is born out of concerns that come from the human sciences, for archaeologists, for heritage professionals. How can we effectively curb the destruction of and looting of cultural assets that ruin the possibilities of building together a shared history? How can new technologies help us? With this webinar, we are opening up the discussion to all professional communities. The Ankis talk series is meant to provide a context to discuss the wide challenges our fields are facing regarding the effective protection of cultural heritage through a transdisciplinary approach. We will address the social, economic and political aspects of the fight against the looting and trafficking of cultural goods as well as the new technologies uh, developed to help us. This transdisciplinary approach, which the project is based on entirely, is meant to straighten the links of our community based on our shared will to fight the looting and trafficking of cultural goods, as well as our collective involvement in a matter that touches all the fields. Amongst this very rich community, the researchers whom we will be listening to during the Yankees talks are experts on the various aspects and fields of the topic. For our very first talk about the use of artificial intelligence to combat the illicit trafficking of cultural heritage, we are delighted to be hearing Dr. Sorin Hermon today. Dr. Hermon is an associate professor at the Cyprus Institute and member of Anki's consortium. His research is situated within two converging fields, digital cultural heritage and heritage science. Dr. Hermon's work aims to develop digital methods for the analysis of artifacts, works of art, archaeological features and buildings to characterize their form, materiality, production techniques, technologies of manufacture and their state of conservation, and by integrating hyperspectral and technical imaging data with 3D documentation. Dr. Sorin Hermon also works on defining global specific protocols and canonial, canonical workflows for data acquisition, processing and post-processing, and its visualization along the 3D geometry. We're all very grateful to hear you today, Sorin, and to discuss together what can AI do to combat the illicit trafficking of cultural heritage. Uh, Dr. Hermon's intervention will be followed by a discussion. So, Sorin, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Veronique, for this kind uh, introduction. And thank you very much for uh, all the participants who came to, to listen. I hope I will be up to the expectations. So, uh, without any further ado, I will start uh, my talk. And I would like to start uh, with a short uh, preamble um, in order to introduce the topic of uh, AI to those who are not uh, very, very familiar and very in-depth in the domain. Um, so after uh, we witnessed for a long time uh, the digital revolution, we are now on the verge of uh, starting uh, probably a new one, which in some ways already started with the web uh, 3.0 which um, it's also called the semantic web. 
and uh, its uh, main goals is to set up a platform, uh, an internet platform which is uh, decentralized. Um, it has a platform neutral computation description, meaning that uh, computer uh, programming languages do not depend on any particular uh, uh, platform. Very importantly for uh, us here is a peer-to-peer -peer exchange of information and the fact that data remains with their owners. Currently, we have uh, um, an internet where uh, people focus on uh, data silos and very big centralized uh, places uh, of data. With the new Web3.0, uh, Web uh, the idea is that data stays with their owners who have full control of it and they share it in a peer-to-peer -peer, uh, uh, environment. So, um, a bit more about uh, AI, artificial intelligence, and uh, web, uh, the, the web 3.0. It aims to leverage machine-based data understanding to develop smarter, connected uh, web experiences. And um, it, 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 it's, it aims at uh, creating an environment, a semantic environment, where we understand meanings of the words and not we are not looking necessarily for the exact words in our search so clearly any kind of um, artificial intelligence and machine learning based models are uh, beneficial to users for uh, selecting relevance so with this uh, approach we are aimed at uh, improving uh, the relevance of our uh, interaction through uh, through the net there are uh, three main components of this uh, revolution, let's say, the Internet of Things, which are, uh, it's a network of uh, physical objects, which are, which are called things, which have all kinds of sensors and software and hardware that transmit and connect information together. So we have a kind of uh, continuous update of uh, information. Um, on the other side, we have uh, artificial intelligence, and you can read here uh, what do they mean? Uh, it's a very basic uh, description of uh, AI. And uh, another aspect that um, many people are pushing to is the open, uh, in this case, it's open science umbrella, but um, the concept of uh, open source, open access, uh, open uh, for peer review, all kinds of uh, openness are very important for, uh, uh, for this um, change in the in the way we are interacting through the web looking now at uh, artificial intelligence per se uh, we are talking primarily on three components one of them is uh, machine learning which are very advanced uh, statistical and mathematical uh, principles to uh, derive um, information out, out of a huge amount of data uh, the other aspect of uh, related to AI is uh, deep learning. And uh, in deep learning, uh, we have um, algorithm software that in a way simulate the way uh, our brain uh, works. So we have um, neural networks. I mean, this is the, one of the uh, common keywords that are used. And you see here uh, some examples of uh, this kind of uh, neural networks that are primarily algorithms that uh, simulate, let's say, the way uh, our brain functions. Uh, as a base for all of them, we have also a dedicated software for natural uh, language processing, which um, should enable computers to understand language as humans uh, understand through uh, all kinds of uh, rule, uh, rules, rule-based uh, models. And this is a very big domain of uh, computational uh, linguistics. So uh, when we talk about uh, artificial intelligence, we have uh, machine learning that uses all kinds of algorithms to train uh, on big data sets to create machine learning models that allow computer system to perform tasks. This is in a nutshell the concept of uh, artificial intelligence. So there are two main components, as we see. One of them is data, 
And I think, I hope many of you are familiar with this guy who actually was a character uh, in, in a movie, in a series some many years ago, who was actually one of the first uh, personifications of artificial intelligence. And on the other aspect that we need is uh, machine learning models. And you see here uh, a short description of what are these uh, models. These are primarily, um, th these are algorithms that we need to train in all kinds of uh, ways, uh, statistical ways, uh, supervised, unsupervised, and so forth, in order to gain new, um, new information out, out of uh, data. So, Coming now more focused on uh, our domain of AI and uh, EDC trafficking, um, it's clear that what we need is to have access to large data sets with a lot of information. And we need to come up also with uh, behavioral patterns for our uh, machine learning uh, models. And uh, here I'm referring to behavioral patterns of um, as all kinds of activities that uh, are related to the DC trafficking. So to identify how uh, looters, for example, would work in, an, in a illegal excavations, how um, objects would be put uh, on an auction on a dark web, and so forth. Currently, there are um, several uh, databases that um, deal with the subject of uh, stolen uh, artifacts. And the examples that you see here are those that um, describe items that have been stolen. They, are, they were reported as stolen and uh, citizen can have various levels of access to these uh, databases. As an example here, one of the largest uh, databases of stolen artifacts come from uh, Italy, from the uh, Car Carabinieri arm, um, a database called uh, Leonardo, where they have more than 1 million uh, records related, but not only to Italian heritage. And you see also in a snapshot, uh, the which kind of description they come with. So we have type of object, if there is an image, um, the subject, author, and uh, some basic descriptions and uh, measurements, uh, these are the standard ones that are uh, accessible to the public. Probably in an internal uh, way, there, there is more uh, information. Actually, the access through and the interaction with the database can be done uh, in two ways. One to uh, enter what they call bolletino, which are uh, kind of, uh, let's say, newsletters, maybe, if I translate it correctly, where you have lists of uh, artifacts. And you can also search, uh, this is a new, relatively new service where you can upload an image and you seek for comparison uh, if there are uh, similar uh, images on, on the system. Um, the Interpol uh, Stolen Works of our database has, according to its website, around 50,000 items. And here, in order to access it, you need to fill uh, a form. Another example uh, is from the FBI, and you see here a snapshot of uh, two published uh, items as uh, stolen. And again, you see the structure of the database, which is uh, very basic in the sense that it provides the title of the work of art, uh, the category, some reference number, uh, who made it, and the materials and some uh, measurements, and if there are some additional information. So, um, talking with the, uh, in all kinds of uh, meetings, projects, and so forth, um, People who are in charge of the, uh, from the law enforcement units um, mentioned that uh, in order for these databases to be efficient, uh, member states need to share information faster in real time as much as possible. And states need to have 
very good, complete as much as possible, uh, publicly available uh, national databases. So they can, then they, the police and the law enforcement enforcement unit can update their own databases. So in order to create this kind of uh, dialogue. Um, another aspect that uh, we can immediately identify is that this kind of data sets, data sets of uh, stolen artifacts um, operate as standalone uh, digital entities in the sense that you access there, you look there, Interpol is not, uh, has its own database, Carabinelli has its own, each one has its own database, which makes any training algorithms um, for machine learning uh, kind of very difficult uh, task, okay? Because as, as uh, I mentioned before, um, AI and ML requires access to very large uh, scales of uh, data sets. I bring here uh, two snapshots from uh, scientific articles, one published in Nature, the other one published in, uh, in a conference proceedings, and both uh, demonstrate as a proof of concept uh, the um, um, the effective uh, application of uh, conventional uh, neural networks in identifying um, stolen artifacts, in this case, based on comparisons of uh, images. Um, in both cases, uh, data sets were built, um, let's say, artificially in a way, uh, in order to train the, the systems. Looking at um, a, project, a European project that um, yeah. finished uh, very recently and uh, our institute was a coordinator, um, the main, one of the main messages was that uh, the absence of a purpose-built uh, data set tailored for training machine learning based tools in recognizing illicitly traded cultural goods online is a constraint for advancing the artificial intelligence system. So we need data sets and as much as possible rich data sets. The other aspect that uh, was highlighted uh, and came out as an outcome of, uh, of this project was that uh, experts need to formulate rules for uh, algorithmic implementation or annotate uh, instances meaning uh, entries in the data, data set of legality or illegality to create a new data set. So this step is very important for achieving an early and automatic identification of illegal trade. We need somehow to make annotation, stolen, stolen. What's their legal status? So apart from the fact that we need large data sets, it's clear that we need also um, rich descriptions of these data sets. And uh, we also need um, behavioral patterns that are uh, accurate in their uh, processes. So here comes uh, Ankees, and as uh, Veronique mentioned in her uh, introduction to, to this project, um, in, uh, in one of our uh, approach is to merge between um, a lot of knowledge that uh, stakeholders, stakeholders uh, have from the humanities research, social, social sciences, um, institutions uh, that deal with um, management of heritage, law enforcement agencies, uh, but also uh, beneficiaries, uh, curators, uh, auction houses, uh, communities, and so forth that should provide these uh, behavioral models, descriptions of uh, data, and so forth, where, and then this bulk of uh, knowledge is taken by um, technology partners to develop uh, more uh, tailored-based uh, tools. So this is an example uh, of uh, what I mean by, what I meant by um, uh, behavioral patterns where we have an uh, archaeological item and, and it may be found and undeclared 
It may come from a looted site. It may come from a looted site that was registered or unregistered. So you see immediately the complications and the implications of uh, having uh, clear legislations and having uh, um, rich national databases where we have lists of our archaeological sites, of monument, heritage monuments, and so forth. This object may be sold either as a in a direct sale or indirect sale through a shop, through an auction house, by an individual, by an institution. So we have to come up somehow at a certain point within this uh, cycle on authentication methods and trace the provenance of these uh, objects. So it's clear that in order to create uh, valuable uh, ML systems, we need to formally describe these uh, patterns in, in this uh, process. So um, how do we stop um, and discover artifacts and how do we authenticate them uh, in order to mention it's a fake, it's a copy, or it's an original, when we find something uh, out there put for uh, either in an auction house or uh, in a shop uh, to be sold. So we can look at uh, its chronology, its uniqueness, its materiality, and so forth. What happens quite often is that um, law enforcement units call an uh, expert and uh, the expert expresses its opinion. So this is an example where, and this is a real case from our uh, lab, it was not done for the purposes of uh, authenticating uh, in case of uh, illegal action. It, it was, uh, it's a work of art that came to us for analysis um, at an initial uh, visual investigations. Um, we, we thought it is a painting from the school of El Greco, but looking uh, more carefully through um, the eyes of um, a digital microscope and uh, also through um, hyperspectral imaging, we identified an original uh, signature, uh, and it's written here, the hand of here, uh, the, uh, the autocolo, so it's a, um, we actually found uh, an El Greco original. So, okay, we need the data. What about this data? I want to um, bring a few slides now to show the complexity of data related to cultural heritage. Cultural heritage is a very broad term. It covers tangible aspects, but it covers also born digital aspects of it. And every heritage item, archaeological artifact, monument, and so forth has embedded its intangible components. So when we look at uh, um, an object exhibited in a museum, when we look at a work of art, when we look at any kind of um, heritage asset, we have to think that actually we have a lot of stories there. We have a lot of uh, uh, components and really a lot of different uh, levels of uh, description of uh, these assets. There is another component uh, of heritage assets. They exist or existed within a cultural landscape, which may have changed through time, in a natural environment, and uh, we have also the temporal uh, dimension. We have churches that were turned into mosques. We have uh, pagan uh, temples that became uh, churches, uh, churches that became uh, uh, palaces and so forth. So uh, we have objects that started in, in one way and they ended in another way. So when we describe heritage asset, we have to think about these multiple uh, layers of uh, uh, landscape uh, as well. So coming now back to our main aspect of preventing, stopping, and discovering uh, works of art and uh, heritage assets that were, uh, are traded in illicit uh, trafficking. How do we do that in, a, in our 
modern uh, connected world, keeping in mind that what uh, we are going towards is the web uh, 3.0 uh, based on the semantic web. So yes, we need data, but actually we need quality data. And some time ago, um, people, uh, experts came up with this uh, FAIR principle for uh, data, uh, FAIR standing for findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And each component, each principle has some subcomponents, and it's very clear and it's very nice. But when we think about it, uh, these uh, principles are primarily aimed at uh, setting up data management plans. There is very little here that talk about the quality of the data. So how do we address quality of uh, data? There are four uh, main components. One of them, quality is something very subjective. So we have to think about relevance. Some data is more relevant than others to different communities. Um, we have to think about data reliability. How do you say, okay, I can trust this data. That's a good data. But also, uh, in terms of, um, let's say, uh, scientific purposes, uh, we need to be able to repeat the creation of the same data following the same protocols and the same processes and reproduce, uh, reproduce it, reaching the same results. But actually, the reality is quite different. And uh, when we look at uh, how data is published very often, we cannot really uh, trace back data provenance, which is a prerequisite for uh, being able to assess its quality. If we don't know how data was, was created, it's very difficult to assess its quality. And this relates to uh, formally presenting how data was created. This formal presentation should be done in a common language, but it, that is understandable both by machines and humans as much as possibly using uh, shared vocabulary and uh, thesauri and using uh, open formats uh, data. And I bring here another uh, short example from a work that uh, we are uh, in, we are, uh, it's one of our uh, flagship projects in our lab. It's uh, the monastery that you see in the picture uh, is uh, it's part of a World Heritage Site in Trodos in Cyprus. So here uh, there are snapshots showing how we are analyzing um, frescoes in this uh, monastery. <laughs> Sorry. Using uh, all kinds of equipment. So um, one of our main uh, goals is to understand the materiality, the uh, techniques of uh, production, the layers, the conservation state, and eventually the authentication uh, of these uh, frescoes and icons using all kinds of uh, tools. So here it's an example of how uh, we pass from a, a analytical observation through, uh, through some statements about the materiality of these frescoes. So we need to be very clear what we are using, which kind of techniques we are using, and in order to um, provide uh, a transparent data, we need to talk about uh, environmental conditions, how this data was processed, which software we used, which protocols for analysis we have uh, conducted, uh, and so forth. So this is an example of uh, outcomes where we formally present out everything that uh, we have done. Um, many people do that already. I mean, people who work in laboratory are very um, are uh, accustomed to have their uh, log and their notebooks uh, where they mention everything about their uh, uh, experimental conditions. But what we need to have is this kind of metadata and paradata being put up there along with the data itself. 
and have clear uh, descriptions of raw, processed, and post-processed uh, data. Another uh, component is uh, we have this huge amount of data. Okay, how do we visualize it? And here is an example of um, um, 3D web-based uh, platform where we can uh, visualize this is the church. Uh, it, it's the main mon church of the monastery, which actually are three churches under this one roof. Every uh, component of it is uh, described separately in a, in a database. And you can see, you can click and choose and see, I will go a bit quicker. And you see full description of everything that is related to that chosen topic in terms of materiality, in terms of uh, measurements, in terms of con conservation conditions and, and so forth. So the solution that uh, we are uh, proposing is to have a semantic representation of data provenance within a virtual research environment. And in order to set up this kind of environment, um, we also suggest to organize the data and describe it within the framework of uh, something that uh, we call uh, the heritage uh, digital twin. And you see here its uh, definition. And I will leave you uh, one, two minutes to, to read to it. Um, the basic idea is to have all the available documentation from humanity, social sciences, um, um, analytic heritage sciences, analytical uh, methods, the, any kind of documentation we have put together, organized uh, in one uh, environment, along with its 3D description, 2D description, and so forth. So um, this work uh, was published uh, some time ago recently, and uh, you see here uh, where you can find much more information about uh, uh, the ontology of, uh, of this uh, work and the Heritage Digital Twin. Um, and you are welcome to visit it and uh, look at it in more uh, details. It's uh, open access, so it can be also downloaded. Um, this is another example of uh, how we address the issue of uh, how we implement uh, the Heritage Digital Twin. And in this case, we worked on a um, painting from a private collection, which was uh, it's donated to a museum in Cyprus here, which depicts uh, Caterina Cornaro, uh, the last uh, queen of uh, Cyprus. This painting is a 16th century copy of a now lost Titian painting, which had some modifications in the 19th century. You see here the differences between the styles of the crown, the style of the uh, cloth between uh, the two periods, with uh, full uh, analytical descriptions and uh, art historical description. And this is a, a knowledge graph where you, you can uh, we are um, actually representing the reasoning process and the inferences that we make according to the different uh, um, domains of uh, analysis, art historical, heritage science, and so forth. All of them, uh, this knowledge graph, uh, mapped and represented with SIDOC uh, CRM, which is an uh, ISO standard uh, for describing uh, heritage assets. So um, there, is a, there are several uh, very large scale uh, uh, European initiative and the European Commission is investing a lot in uh, creating uh, high quality data related to cultural heritage. And they bring here uh, some of them and um, our vision on how to create this uh, um, heritage uh, data ecosystem with the European Collaborative Cloud for Heritage Data, with the European uh, Data Space, and other uh, 
initiative related uh, initiative we need to invest a lot in uh, harmonizing uh, thesauri and terminologies uh, we need to overcome language barrier uh, enrich content of course and uh, identify uh, unique traits of items and highlight them in order to arrive to specificities of every item so clearly we need uh, rich descriptions this is another um, um let's say sc scheme of a possible uh, uh, system based on the ecch eccch where we are integrating um, data coming from different sources integrating uh, digilab of uh, iris europeana other uh, sources from daria for example have them all in a visualization platform and then apply all kinds of tools that would help us in the process of uh, authentication. So uh, this is my final uh, slide where um, I suggest that in order to have and implement uh, successful AIs to combat the illicit trafficking of cultural goods, we need semantic aware quality data and a lot of it. We need accurate models that describe behaviors of uh, uh, typical behaviors of uh, in this uh, domain of the illicit trafficking and uh, create and rely on rich data ecosystems for uh, to create this uh, large ecosystems for heritage uh, di digital uh, based on the heritage digital uh, twin um i would like to thank in this uh, from in this perspective uh, our collaboration with the Cyprus uh, Department of Antiquities, uh, with the Cyprus uh, Police, uh, the Organized Crime Unit prim primarily, which is responsible for the DC trafficking of uh, cultural uh, goods, and um, the work that I uh, presented here is part of several uh, EU-funded projects that uh, our group uh, participated uh, crime art, uh, Ariadne, for CH, uh, Iris, uh, Iberion, and uh, we hope to bring all this knowledge also into Ankis. So, thank you very much. I'm done. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Sorin, for all that you talked about. It was really interesting. And of course, we have the first few questions in the chat. Uh, probably we can start from them and then uh, we can go on with the discussion. Um, and actually, the two questions are intertwined. Uh, uh, the first is from uh, uh, Rodrigo. And the big pro the he says the big problem how to identify an unregistered object looted from an archaeological site, and then uh, we have Gary who says how can you have data provenance for looted objects when you have an, uh, no information where and how it was found? So these are a question for you, but um, maybe also for other cons Ankhism consortium uh, participants partners. So, uh, Veronique, do you want to answer or should I answer first and then you? Okay. No, you're welcome to answer. Okay, so um, actually, my one of my messages is that in order to have a, a good, uh, an effective uh, fight against the DC trafficking, we need to have uh, very good descriptions of our uh, of data that of objects that are not looted because in this way we can create comparative material we need to have so i'm looking here on the data provenance for looted objects we want to have data provenance of non-looted objects first and we need to have these uh, descriptions in a, as rich as possible uh, way because in this way we may identify traits we may come up with the uh, uh, details that will help us in training these um, algorithms and these uh, tools that uh, I mentioned on AI. There is no other way. Um, so this is uh, one thing. The other aspect about the um, looted uh, sites, um, 
Am I reading correctly the idea of how many of these looted objects are listed or um, can you please, uh, Marco, repeat the question of Rodrigo? The Rodrigo's question says, uh, the big problem, how to identify an unregistered object looted from an archaeological site? Well, I would connect that also to um, the challenge of different legislations. In many countries, by default, an archaeological object, if it's if it appears in an un, uh, um, let's say in an unofficial uh, environment, it's illegal because there is a law of protection of heritage. So if it's not registered, if it does not have a number, if it does not appear somewhere, it means that it is a <laughs> it has an uh, illegal dimension to it. That's why we need to have national rich databases. We need to have very clear uh, lists of archaeological sites, archaeological risk areas. We need to have uh, rich inventories. Because uh, at the end of the day, this is uh, one way to, to combat them. I know that in other countries, the legislations can be are slightly different. And then we may have uh, problems, but also there, uh, if we come up with uh, traces, for example, we are sure that what we see is an old object. Uh, we have objects that are, uh, it's clear that they are uh, archaeological objects or works of, uh, works of art that are protected by the law of uh, antiquities, then we we have a problem and we have to solve it. Um, and I would also add that um, it's also an issue that is addressed in the toolkit that the project Ankis aims to develop. Um, it's a study that is also based on um, looting patterns and uh, illicit excavations patterns. Um, crossed with information coming from the archives of uh, the archaeologist and uh, the archives of ongoing excavations. Um, so there are some possibilities and we hope to address them in a more precise way uh, in some of uh, in the next session of uh, webinar, for instance, and especially during the project. Uh, concerning yes, monitoring, that... monitoring is a very important aspect in combating uh, Illicit trafficking. We have to come up with large scale, small scale, localized uh, monitoring systems, satellite imaging, flying drones, all kinds of uh, tools that uh, Ankis will uh, address, as Veronique mentioned. Yeah. And concerning that, I just sent uh, on the chat a link for a leaflet that we created in the framework of the, the Ankisa project to simply explain the kind of tools that have been developed in the framework of the Ankisa project. Um, if there are any other question, please, please uh, feel free now to take the floor and uh, speak up. I see also some uh, comments, so maybe you can read, uh, they're not necessarily questions, but... Yeah, it uh, just arrived. For human intelligence, we have the same needs, quality data. Quality data on stolen parts is already insufficient for the public. Yes, we agree. We agree. Okay. Um, uh, since I, I don't see any other comments or questions for uh, the audience, maybe Pier Giacomo, we can uh, go to the to the last remarks of uh, the, uh, the last remark is first of all thanks uh, the participant for being so numerous in the first uh, and his uh, talk uh, and of course uh, what is important is to remind that uh, there are two other dates uh, that has been already set uh, the first one is the 14th of march uh, so just in a couple of months uh, where Jerome Maclean will talk about what can nanotechnologies do to combat the illicit trafficking of antiquities. 
The third event, on the contrary, has been scheduled on the 6th of June with Benjamin Omer about the role of the antiquities market in criminal money laundering. So these are the two important issues. I see that many people have already registered for these two events, so we hope that the audience will be so important as we have today. Thank you very much once more. Thank you very much to Soreen for breaking the ice with this first presentation and hope to see all of you soon on the 14th of March. Thank you very much.